Hey, I'm Fireball Tim, and welcome to the first annual world-class automotive film and arts festival. Join me with the uh, in these awesome chairs. Why don't you have a seat in the center one right there? Thank you. What do you got? What is this? So these are what was made what made it possible for me to go across the country in the back seat of that car. These are travel jobs. One small step for mankind. <laughs> and these are for me. <laughs> I need three of them. Well, I was thinking maybe someone out there might want one. Just to get back to LA. Yeah. It, that movie is is overwhelming. In, in, I think the biggest thing for me was the fact that not only did you direct this, but you actually experienced this thing. Yes. You know, this is not something where you put a lot of pieces together, but you were actually in the thick of it. How did it feel to be doing that? It was amazing. I had the best seat uh, anyone could ask for, you know, sort of like the e-ticket or the best roller coaster ride you could ever right. get on. Yeah. And, and how many of these did you actually use? <sighs> Thank goodness I didn't keep count. <laughs> it's not that easy in no. the back seat going 125 and trying to use one of those. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. What, what was the inspiration? I mean, what, what got you going on this initially? The inspiration was actually uh, my, my dad's best friend, Doug. Mm -hmm. You know, I had known him since I was a very small child, and he was such an amazing man in terms of, you know, it's one of those people who live life every single day and appreciate yeah. every moment, and that's what this run really was about. You know, for a day and a half straight, we were just conscious of what we were doing and what we were up against, and Doug was like that. He raced his entire life, and wow. he was all about pushing the limits and pushing himself and challenging, and he really was the inspiration for this film. I think that was something I wanted to share with people. I thought it was an amazing feat. It wasn't about that we broke laws. It was about that, um, you know, you can push yourself to achieve things responsibly, but at the same time, pushing, pushing that red line. Well, I think if you look back in history, if, if everyone followed the rules exactly the way they were, we would not have the achievements we have as a, as a race. You know, it's interesting that, that people um, have an overwhelming need to express themselves in a variety of ways. And a lot of those are ways that, uh, uh, that have to push those envelopes. You know, and I think it, you can go all the way back to Henry Ford and, or just people telling you in general that you, you can't do this. Right. And all the limitations, all the reasons why you can't. Um, because for, for them, it's difficult to be able to see that as a success. But sure. inside, you feel this need to express that. And for you, it was expressing that experience through film. Yeah. Uh, for those guys, it was expressing it through the drive. Yeah. Uh, uh, everyone has their own individual thing. Tell me, tell me a little bit about for, for your your own experience, you know, why is it that, that film is so attractive to you to be able to, as a Ooh. medium for expression? Good question. Um, I think I've always just been a very visual person, you know. Um, I grew up in Southern California, in Orange County. I spent a lot of time on freeways. My parents um, divorced when I was young, so I was constantly going in between their houses on the freeway, and that's a visual thing as a child. You're sitting in the back seat, you're looking out the window, uh, scenery is going by, what are they playing on the radio, you just get this really neat sense of a visual rush and a feeling. You're a freeway kid. Uh, totally, yeah. And, uh, so I think that probably lent itself well to film in that, you know, you're, for long stretches of time, you're watching and you're seeing things and, and when the music melds with the scenery outside the window of the car, it's an amazing thing and whatever it is you're thinking. So I think for me, film is just a great way to express myself. Um, I'm, a, I'm a people person, but in terms of, uh, you know, if you're going to do something film for me, visual I, is where I connect. Yeah, yeah. and you, you, you come, we saw some of the challenges that you went through. And of course, doing, uh, attempting to do this race, and then meeting with what seemingly failure. Yes. Um, what are some of the other challenges that, that you went through in making the film itself that, that push you right to that edge where you potentially have qu questioned whether the, that this was a a viable project, can I do this? 
Um, what are some of the things that went through? Oh, your this mind? is uh, uh, the gamut, everything. It's a, it was a 10-year journey to get from the start to the finish, and um, it was storytelling was our biggest, my biggest hurdle. You yeah. know, how do you tell a compelling story that also throws in all those other things you want to say? And you know, as a as a storyteller, you know it when it's right, and when it's not right, you're kind of like. Uh, um, well, I don't really know. So it was hard to keep going, but, you know, perseverance, just knowing it. I knew it was out there. It was that, that like, sort of Rubik's Cube you can't crack. So are you saying that sometimes you don't necessarily have to know the hows? You just have to be persistent and keep going? Being persistent and keep going and believing in what the base of the story was. I mean, to me, the base of the story was... Um, it wasn't reckless driving. It wasn't speed. Again, it was about guys who knew what they were doing. They knew how well they could drive, and they understood what a machine does on the road. And, you know, that's that's kind of what kept me in line. Like, I just like, oh, the base of this thing, there's a great story, and I just know it's there. And, and so, yeah, at the end of the day, the time was the hard thing, how long it took to, for me to finally understand how to tell a good story and get it now, out. Now, did you edit this also, or, or what are some of the other roles that you played besides backseat driver, back driver? And, uh, and director? <laughs> yes. Right. No, uh, I had a hand in uh, a little bit of the editing, but I had multiple editors come on, uh -huh. and you go down a road thinking you got it, and then you screen it, and people say, well, but I don't get this. The very last thing we did that cracked this for us was uh, we added the narration. The narration mm -hmm. was not something that we did early on. This came the very tail end. Because people would see the film and they'd say, wait, there's a girl in the back seat. <laughs> Where did she come from and you know, why is she here? So the, good, the way to connect the old to the new was, well, a asking me to, to guide you along. And so that was the, really the last. Yeah. I mean, you must feel good. I mean, uh, these guys cheered when they, that, that, number, so great. that never came. And that, that does feel good. I mean, let's give her a hand. You know, this, this was, is not an easy thing to put together and uh, to be able to to do a film like this and to show success you know that's quite extraordinary thank so you. give her a hand for thank that you. thank you you said 10 years 10 years so you, you started when you were 16 <laughs> exactly thank you <laughs> that checks in the mail <laughs> absolutely um, what do you you know with achieving a film like this this is your first festival very first so this is exciting. We yes, got a chance. Thank you to... very much. I have it's to... such an honor to be um, asked to come and screen at this festival. It's sure. really wonderful in this in Monterey during Pebble Beach. Um, thank you very much. It's just a cool place. Isn't it, it is very yeah. cool place. So what's what's on the agenda now? What do you want to do next? I'd like to get into the driver's seat of one of these cars <laughs> this weekend at Pebble Beach. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't, that would and be just nice. take one home. Right. They forget, got plenty. Forget the back seat. They might as well just give one up, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. There's enough. Well, we're going to give these guys a chance. Does anyone have a question for Corey? I'm just curious what your next project may be. Any thoughts of a sequel? I would love a sequel. If anyone out there wants to see if they can best 3104. Um, I have a, two other films in uh, post-production. One is on uh, the Gracie family who invented the ultimate fighting championship. They're from Brazil. And another one on the 40th anniversary of the film Deliverance. So you know, light topics. Very cool. So back to the editing. Uh, you've got all these cameras on the car and your handheld camera from the back seat. How much you were recording, were you doing any live switching during that uh, time? And did you lose footage or did you record everything that was happening? Good question, yeah. Um, so we had four decks recording. I think you saw a shot of that at one point. And I could switch through um, six different cameras at any given time. So at night, of course, we'd take the middle one off the drivers because you couldn't see them anyway, so we'd throw the infrared one on. So I was, yeah, I was switching through cameras. Um, there were some mishaps, for sure. Um, you get tired, and you look down, and you said, oh my god, I, I thought I pressed record. I didn't. I hit stop. You know, um, there were batteries that went out. At the very end, I don't know if you saw it, so we're driving, it's that race in, and Maher's like, dude, you gotta put your foot down. And Alex says to him, you know, are you telling me if we don't do 120, I'm not gonna break it? We had to subtitle him, because we got back in the car, and all of a sudden, Alex's love went dead. And now it's the last run in, there's no more stops, and the only batteries I have for that love are in the trunk. <laughs> and there's no way they're pulling over. So, little things like that, you know, when I see the movie, and I think, 
ah, you know, I, I, but little things like that happened, but. So the other question was those really bitchin' binoculars. What was that all about? Was oh. Cord and how did, yeah. how did that work? So those binoculars, I don't know exactly what the brand was. I need to write this down. But um, Alex knew that those were fantastic for seeing in the distance. The thing that came off it that was plugged in was a gyro stabilizer. In fact, the guys in 83, Doug and David, they went to a Hollywood set company and they rented gyro stabilizers for themselves on their binoculars. Wow, that's high tech. Yeah, Alex watched a ton of my footage and he gleaned so many things from the guys who did this back in the day. And so he copied that very same thing. And I tried to do it with my camera, but the weight and it was, it was a little difficult. There was one in the plane as well. They had the same thing, but it was a stabilizer for the camera. So with an hour and a half movie, mm -hmm. how much actual footage did you shoot? From start to finish, interviews, all the footage that we collected, there's over 800 hours. 800 hours to make an hour and a half. And I've feature. seen it all more than once. <laughs> That's crazy. That's a lot of editing time. Yeah. And, and it was it, all great footage, wasn't it? Thank you. Yes, and more will be released. Everyone asks, yeah. asks you know, there are people who want to sit through the whole 3104 <laughs> live. I think that would be a great um, installation in a museum, right? You're walking by, there's a glass case. Dudes and just put it on there. a loop. Right. So it can display over and over. <laughs> no, they have to sit there and watch the whole thing in a Recaro seat, like a video game. Absolutely. And they can only get up when we pee, so. W what year was this film? Say again? What year? Um, well, the film began in 2002. The run was in, uh, both runs were in 2006. 2006. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? Uh, what was your experience like sitting in the back seat? It was amazing. It was, um, it felt like I was going back in time in a way, and it felt like I wasn't part of reality at the same time because you are moving so fast over the earth and you're constantly just passing and passing and passing. And you're in a different space than most people. Most people are going to the grocery store, coming back from work, going home, whatever they might be doing. And they're, you know, you do this, you get kind of in your life and things go by you. Well, for 31 hours straight, there was nothing else on our mind. Even, you know, two days beforehand, two days afterwards, um, you are in that moment every second of the day. So it was an amazing, amazing experience. I got the e-ticket, okay. the ultimate okay. e-ticket. But what I'm trying to figure out is when I'm driving a car and cutting in and out of traffic like that in the front seat, it, uh, you know, my heart races. What, what do you do in the back seat when they're doing stuff like that? How did you prepare yourself to deal with the, the anxiety of going that fast? This is a funny thing, and this is, um, mothers have a hard time relating to my answer when I say that the anxiety wasn't about going fast. The anxiety was they weren't going fast enough. Doug had drilled into me, Doug and David both, over and over, you have to go as fast as you can go every second you can go fast. And so any time Alex or David, more Alex than David, were giving reasons like, oh, there might be a cop up here, there might be this, they're slowing down. and. I would just get a little anxious, like, no, you need to go faster right now because we don't know what's coming, you know? So for me, the anxiety only came when um, the, the technical things that I had to deal with, running the cameras, running the batteries, making sure I could hear them, the mixer, all those things, that, that's what caused me anxiety. Going fast was not, going fast was exactly what you would imagine it being like, which is, oh my God, just, I hope you can keep going this fast. But could you do it if you weren't filming and doing all the other stuff that was going on and just watching what they were doing? There were times, you mean, did I have some moments of just enjoying it? Uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There were absolutely moments when I put the camera down, and look out the window, lean in a little bit, look at the speedometer, hold on, and yeah, just try to enjoy the moment. And there were yeah. times, go ahead. It's interesting because you're, in, in a way, it's a, a, a euphoric experience because it's like singleness of purpose is that people drive around, and you know that as you're driving around, you're thinking. You're thinking you're at the office or you're someplace else while people drive. And, and, and many times people say, well, I don't even remember the drive because I was thinking about something else. And what's interesting about what you guys achieved is that you had to be very present in every moment to achieve something great. And that's quite a message for just anything, is yeah. that people that want to achieve certain things 
You have to stay present. You have to have that singleness of purpose. Well, and I think that's kind of the message about driving. I had a whole section about driving, driver's training, and how people drive. And certain people said, you know, get off your soapbox. Don't put that in the movie. But it's about driving well. It's about knowing what you're doing and knowing the car. And, and so that makes sense that that would be part um, of it. One of the questions I had from the movie was, did you guys go from the exact same location to the exact finish? Good question. No, we did not go from the exact same. We did not do the exact same. Um, there's, again, there'll be footage of this released. Uh, we tested out leaving from the same point they did, which was at 1st and 90th in Manhattan. And at the same exact time, they would have left. And we just sat in red lights. And there was some logistical reasons why it would be great to finish on the Santa Monica Pier for us. And so we did the math. And the math was that if we didn't break it by a half an hour, we couldn't safely say we did what we did. So for us, and I think that's part of where the panic comes from, was we knew we, did, we couldn't just make like 3206 and feel like, yeah, we did it. We had to go way beyond what they did. So um, no, we have, no one has done since, actually. Good question. The exact same location to the exact same location. All right, let's give uh, Corey a round of applause. Thank you so much Thank for joining us much. today. Thank you. Very much. Appreciated.